Welcome to another edition of Phil's Morning Drive. I couldn't be more excited to be sharing with you the 2005 Lotus Elise. you're probably asking yourself what's it like to drive the 2005 Lotus Elise well the driver focus in here is just over the top the shifters in the perfect spot the steering wheel is perfect how you sit in these seats is perfect the pedals are perfect if you want to do heel toe downshifts and also uh, it gives you the ability to really feel like you are in control of the car you can really hear the engine behind your head you can really feel really every bump in the road. It's not the smoothest of rides, but you just forget about all of that, especially if you like to drive. And you know, there's really not that much wind noise in here. I do have the windows up at this particular time so we can record some audio and I can visit with you a little bit. And we're doing about 40 to 50 miles per hour. And it's really pretty minimal, especially compared to most convertibles. I think a lot of it has to do with how high that the back window and the whole back section is there and how low that you sit in the car. You know, being such a driver-focused car, it really is such a pleasure to drive. I love this shifter. It's got that kind of bolt-action feel to it. So when you shift, it really, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot more drama to driving this car than there is most other cars, especially from this era. You know, as modern cars have gotten stability control and traction control and paddle shifters and all this stuff, all that technology is great. But if you're looking for something that's a little more raw, Lotus has just continued to do that. I mean, they, they've upgraded some things here and there just to make the driving experience better and just to get the weight out of the car, but as far as the performance and just the sheer joy of driving, it's really, really hard to beat any Lotus, but especially the Elise. You know, when they stopped sending this car to the U.S. in 2011, I was really sad. I, I like the Evora. I've not driven one, but it's, it seems to me to be a little bit more of a sophisticated car than this, as opposed to this bare bones feel. It doesn't have the open top option, which I think really adds to the overall feeling of this car. You really get a sense for how low this car sits when you're in traffic uh, with the roof off. Let's talk some numbers on this car. The car has uh, a 1.9 liter inline four cylinder in mounted. It gets about 190 horsepower and 138 pound feet of torque. Something else that adds to the driving ability or the, the way that this car will make you feel is the exhaust note and just the sound of that engine. Even though it's a four cylinder, it kind of roars behind your, your head. I'll give you a chance to hear what the exhaust sounds like on this car. revs all the way up to 7800 which is it's just a really really peaky motor it really just it has a great sound to it it's got a lot of uh, range to it as far as the, the different gearing and everything you're really finding the perfect gear and finding the perfect place to be to get out of a turn or to get the most amount of power is pretty easy to do once you've driven it for really not a lot of time at all some cars I feel like it takes a while to get used to the fact that second gear is this way or third gear is this way or whatever and I noticed with uh, with this car that's not really the case all right let's give you an idea of what this car sounds like that's pretty close to the red line there's a very nice by the way that was almost 70 there was uh, there's a very nice light there's a, uh, a rev limiter light that, that comes on and lets you know when you're gonna shift What's really interesting about this engine is when you get close to about 5,500 or 6,000 RPM, 7,800 is the red line. As you get close to that, it really starts to pull even harder. So you really gotta be ready with the shifter. 
Like right now we're in third, you can drop it in fourth. It's just got a great feel to it. And the car almost feels like it wants to be driven hard. It, it wants you to push the clutch in and it wants you to just kind of manhandle this stick shift. I'm telling you, if you drive a car like this, you won't care anymore ever again about wanting to know about paddle shifters because the, the, the driver interaction with this is just top notch, it really is. We'll give it some more juice here and let you kind of hear it again. Put it in second. So that, that kind of gives you the idea of what it's going to sound like after you really get with it. And we still haven't used fifth or sixth gear. This is a very important car not only for the Lotus brand but also for American customers of performance cars because this car replaces the Esprit which had been around for a very long time and this car was available in Europe starting in 1996. However, we didn't get it until 2005, almost a decade later. This is a very lightweight car. In fact, I would call it an ultra lightweight car. It weighs around 2,000 pounds, so around one ton. And when you have a car like this, it really means that there's not a lot of creature comforts, there's not a lot of ability for you to carry things. You'll notice here on the front, for example, a lot of cars like the Porsche Boxster, Porsche Cayman, they have a front trunk. Nothing opens on the front of this. If you look in here, you have to kind of peek around. You can see uh, the cooling system there. So the front does house something, but there's no way that you can carry any cargo there. If you want to carry some cargo, we have to walk around to the back of the car and you have to get the key out of your pocket. There's no re remote for, for this, there's no button, there's no power trunk or anything. To save weight, this is almost flimsy. I'll show you what I mean. You put the key in here, you open this up and you can see it's, it's oh, it's so lightweight. And in fact, there's no struts on this. You have to use the old fashioned stick like you did a long time ago. This houses the mid-engine four cylinder as well as the trunk and as you can see, we've got uh, some jumper cables, we got a briefcase and a couple things in there. The battery uh, is off to the left, so that's taking up some of your cargo space as well. Obviously the engine very compact, it's a mid-engine layout, and you'll notice Lotus performance everywhere except this is one of the few clues that this engine is sourced by the folks at Toyota. So I think that gives people peace of mind to realize that the car is going to be extremely reliable. This particular model is a 1.9 liter four cylinder and it puts out about 190 horsepower, but because of the weight, that doesn't sound like a very big engine, and it isn't, but because it's such a low weight car, they're able to get a zero to 60 time of about 4.8 to 4.9 seconds in the 2005 model. As you move into the newer models, they offered things like a supercharger, they had a bigger engine, so horsepower just went up and up, and I believe the fastest one would be in the low four second range and that would be around 2010 or 2011. Now part of the reason that the car went out of production, at least in the US in 2011, is because they had an exemption for the smart airbags. This car does not have smart airbags and so that ran out, they didn't put smart airbags in it and so therefore the Elise is not being sold in America anymore. Only the Evora is sold here at the current time. Now one thing that makes the 2005 Elise very unique is the headlights and the reason for that is because they had to get special permission from the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration because these headlights and the bumper didn't meet the U.S. regulations at the time. Well, they allowed them to have a three-year exemption on that. So you'll notice if you start looking at some of the newer models that the lights become a little bit different each time. Now you may have noticed in our drive that the car has no roof. It actually does have a roof. We left it in the garage today. This particular model has the dual top option, uh, which I've heard is kind of rare. I, I know uh, some folks don't really want to have the hard top because it, it can be quite a bit of a hassle. That's what's normally on this car, especially in the cooler months. But the hard top itself is body colored, so it's the same color as the exterior, and it requires tools to install, which is a little bit different than the target tops or the T-tops, if you will, of days gone by. As far as the soft top, it's, uh, it's really not to be used other than just for security if you're parking somewhere and you don't want anybody to be able to get in the car or if you think that it might rain. And how it works is there's two pieces and they one goes here 
and then one goes on the other side and then you have a soft top that has like an accordion type thing that stretches over the, the top. The owner of this car that was gracious enough to let me borrow it, uh, they've never had the soft top out of the bag that it came in in the factory, so I, I said, well, let's not open it just for Phil's morning drive. Now because this is such a hardcore sports car, and I mentioned about the creature comforts, but getting in and out of this car is a little bit of a trick. It's easier with the roof off, I'll say that. So you open the, the door and you'll notice right away that the seat is a lot lower than the frame. That's because you literally sit down in the frame. So there's a couple ways to do this. I just like to kind of slide in and kind of just bring your feet around, but you really almost have to be uh, a little bit of a, a contortionist really to try to get in the car. But once you're in, Oh, these seats are so comfortable. I've read where the newer models have a little more padding to the seat because some folks complained in 2005 that these seats were not uh, as soft as they could be. But I've been driving this car around for two or three days and I think it's great. But then again, if you've watched any of my other films, you would know that I love these sports seats. They, they, they wrap around you. These do not have very much padding, that is true. Uh, but. Um, they feel great, and for what the car is, you know, it's supposed to give you a race car feel, and it certainly does. It certainly does do that, and as far as the uh, options with these seats, these do have the optional leather seats. There's different colors that you can get. The black's a little more subtle. I've seen tan. I've seen red. There's a lot of different choices as far as that goes. You know, as far as other things in here, you really don't get a lot of equipment, and that is just fine by me. It's very, very driver focused, and you're noticing that there's not a lot of annoying buttons on the steering wheel other than the horn, which is just right there and here on both sides. But there's no paddle shifters. There's no Bluetooth. It's actually a very small steering wheel, which actually sourced by the folks at Momo, as a matter of fact, a very popular racing steering wheel there. It almost feels like the wheel should come off to help you get in and out. It does not. Uh, but other buttons in here, we've got the start button over here. We've got lights over here on the left as well. We've got your turn signals, windshield wipers. That's about it. In the middle, we've got a uh, what looks like an aftermarket stereo. This is actually how it does come from the factory, from the folks at Blahpunkt. It does play MP3 CDs, which is nice. It uh, opens up. It really just looks like something that you would get at any electronic store. It has four speakers. We've got two in the dash and then there's two behind your head here. It's not the greatest sound system ever, but I think a lot of cars like this don't even have a sound system, so it kind of helps to, I, I guess, uh, make your journey a little bit more comfortable. I personally like to listen to the engine, but that's the way it is. So this is the actual frame of the car, which you can see makes a nice armrest, but it also gives you an idea of how close that you're sitting to the ground. Right now the door is open and you can see I can just, uh, well you can see how far it is to the ground. It's not very far at all. I think the total height of this car is about three foot seven inches or three foot eight inches, somewhere in there. So when you're sitting down here, I would say your rear end is probably, I don't know, probably six inches off the ground, something like that. But boy, it really adds to the overall driving experience. Sitting so low and the driving position in this car really uh, changes your feeling as far as the sensation of speed. It feels quite a bit faster than you're actually going, which maybe is a good thing. So maybe you'd get less speeding tickets with this car. but. You know, the speedometer climbs so quickly, that can really be uh, just probably, I would say that it would be an issue for some people. Um, other things to say about the driving position, the seat itself wraps around you, the steering wheel is right here, the shifter is right here. I mean, you've got very minimal amounts of space in between these, these different uh, things that you're going to need to drive, whether it be the e-brake or the shifter or the steering wheel. There's, there's not a lot of distance between those. This car really is very much about making the driver comfortable uh, and the passenger just gets to come along for fun. There's not, there's not much for, for them to really do over there except hang on. Let's talk about pros and cons on this car. I mean, pros, obviously, it's got power, it's got handling, it's extremely sporty. I personally don't think there's any cons to this car for what it is, which is supposed to be a hardcore sports car that you could take to the track if you wanted to, but it's certainly fine just, just jetting around on roads outside of town. I suppose if you had cons, getting in and out of the car is not easy to do. Cargo space is very minimal. You're not gonna be able to take very many things with you. I still think that if you had a duffel bag that you and a friend could take a road trip somewhere, but I also think that you may not want to. 
As far as the hardness of these seats, if you're if you're wanting to think about taking a road trip or something, for me they've been fine. I mean, they can get a little hard after a while, but I think uh, when you realize how much fun it is to drive, you'll realize that the seats are fine. So what's the verdict? Should you buy a car like this? You know, I think if you're wanting something that is more hardcore than a Porsche Boxster, a Porsche Cayman, certainly more hardcore than a Audi TT or a BMW Z4, I think this really hits on that mark. When this car was new, it was $42,900 plus a few options. And really today, you can get one for not too much less than that. So if you did buy one, it's really held its value quite well. But also, um, it gives you the opportunity. I think you could probably find one in very good shape in the low to mid 30s. This particular one only has 21,000 miles on it, and I think there's quite a few examples like that out there. When I got on cars.com, before we started shooting, I noticed that they really range in price from about 25,000, which is one that who knows what the history of it is, and it probably has in the 60, 70, or 80,000 miles up to $60,000, which would be for a 2010 or a 2011, the last couple years they made them. That would have the supercharged engine, and some of them only had like a thousand miles on them. So there's a nice range there if, if you are looking for something like this. I would recommend the dual top option. I think the hard top really looks nice on it. The soft top, a little cumbersome, but I wouldn't want to just have the soft top and try to rely on that for all the time, especially if you did want to go on a highway trip and had no interest in taking the top off.